Hi guys, it's Michelle and today's video is going to be another unsolved mysteries video for you guys. These are some of like really really scary unsolved cases. So I'm editing this because last night I went to like dinner and I like had my hair super cute curly and whatever. Um, like I guess I didn't really like fully look in the mirror and realize it literally looks like a rat's nest. Like it looks like so bad. Because as I was filming it when I'm sitting so far away from the viewfinder, like it looked good in the viewfinder because I can't really see it up close. So just ignore that. What is, it's curly from yesterday. So, you know. So does anyone know any good extra hold hairsprays? Because I swear my hair just doesn't hold curls anymore and it's really weird. So let me know. But without further ado, let's get into it. The first unsolved mystery is about a 17 year old boy named Kurt Sova who lived with his parents in the suburbs of Cleveland, Ohio. So Kurt was a very normal kid. He really stayed out of trouble. He was the youngest of four boys and he was really close with his parents. On Friday, October 23rd, 1981, he left his house to meet up with one of his friends. His friend suggested that they go to a Halloween party that was at a duplex about two miles away. Sadly, Kurt never returned home that night and the next morning was a Saturday and that was when his parents began to worry. His mother, Dorothy, of course, called all of his friends and couldn't find any information and then his father Ken as well went searching the neighborhood. On Sunday, Kurt was registered as a missing person with the Cleveland police. This is when his mother Dorothy began placing, you know, images and flyers of Kurt around the neighborhood. So that Sunday afternoon is when Kurt's mother discovered that he was at a party at a duplex the night that he went missing. So she decided to go over to the duplex and try to talk to the girl who held the party named Susan. She wasn't there at the time, but she ended up contacting Kurt's mom later that night. Susan claimed that she had not seen Kurt and that there was no party at her duplex that night. However, a pizza delivery man claimed that there was a party at the duplex. So then this is when Kurt's mother contacted Susan again, and she did claim that Kurt was there and that she did have a party. So really suspicious, obviously, that she lied about it. So guests at the party were claiming that Kurt was drinking Everclear, which is a very strong drink and it's literally illegal in parts of the United States. And because of his small build and lack of drinking history, like he wasn't really drinking that much prior to this that his parents knew of, it was likely that Kurt got very, very drunk. Kurt's friend later said that he took an intoxicated Kurt outside to get some air and then he went back inside to grab Kurt's jacket, but when he returned with the jacket, Kurt was missing. His parents really began to suspect foul play, especially with Susan changing her story. He thought, like, obviously the parents thought that was incredibly suspicious. So that is what they suspected. At a record store nearby, there were flyers of Kurt up and this strange man came and talked to the owner of the record store and he said, quote, might as well take it down. He's gonna be found dead in two days and nobody's gonna know how he died, which is really scary. On Monday, following the Friday night party, one of Kurt's schoolmates was headed to a job interview. He claims that he saw Kurt walk up to a van of people he didn't know. So they didn't seem like locals or people who went to his school. And he claims that Kurt was shouting like, hey Franco, multiple times. Unfortunately, the classmate didn't suspect anything because he wasn't aware of Kurt's missing status. Sadly, just six days after the party on October 28th, Kurt's body was found in a ravine on Harvard Street, just 500 yards away from the duplex. So for some reason, the cause of death could not be determined and it was later included by the coroner that he had died of naturally or by accident, which his parents did not accept this answer. The autopsy had also revealed that he had died 24 to 36 hours prior to being found, which he had been missing for five days, and his father claimed that he searched the ravine on Monday and that he was not there. And of course, we have that account from the schoolmate who was also saw Kurt on Monday morning. The family really believed that Kurt passed away in the duplex and then was transported later to the ravine. Monday night or Tuesday morning. The same day that Kurt's body was found, record store owner who was like approached by that strange man who was saying that the search was pointless received a bouquet of flowers and a note that said, quote, roses are red, the sky is blue, they found him dead and they will find you dead too. And of course she immediately freaked out and told the police because that's terrifying. They found the man who was the one who said that the whole search was pointless and they interviewed him, determined that he was mentally and emotionally disturbed, but ultimately ruled him out in Kurt's case. So the thing that's a little confusing is that it's possible but not suspected that this like quote unquote Franco character 
is the same guy that went to the record store, but no one could really determine that for sure. So that makes the case a little confusing. Sadly, Kurt's parents later passed away without hearing any new information on the case, as well did two of his brothers. But his third brother, Kevin, is still alive and still searching for answers. I really hope that Kevin like gets the answers that are needed. Of course, this case is extremely confusing, especially because it seemed like Kurt was a very normal kid who didn't seem to get involved with trouble at all. It's just really, really weird that he would go to this party and then potentially continue to remain missing for a few days before he passed away because of the coroner report um, saying that after his body was found, it had only been 24 to 36 hours, even though he had been missing for five days. It's just very strange and honestly, none of it really adds up or makes any sense. I would love to hear you guys' opinions or any thoughts that you have on this case. Like, I would say it's definitely a possibility that at this party he got mixed up with the wrong kind of crowd. But I just don't understand, like, anything. It's so confusing and I just feel so bad for his family. Like, that's just awful to go through. Hopefully, since this was on Unsolved Mysteries, more people will hear the case and maybe someone knows something. And that would be really great for his family. But what do you guys think about this case? I would love to know. The next Unsolved Mystery is actually one of the craziest, like, things that I have ever heard. And I am so confused confused like just completely I don't understand what could have happened. So an elderly couple named Bill and Dorothy Wacker were living in a small town of Stark County, Ohio. They've been living in the same house for most of their 48 years of marriage and all of a sudden they began to be harassed. 1984 their home was ransacked through twice but in January of 1985, it was for a third time and this is when they decided to inform the police. July of 1985, Dorothy was home alone recovering from heart surgery and a man came to her door that she didn't know, but he asked her if he could use her phone because his car broke down nearby. So she let him in. After saying goodbye, she assumed that he had actually left the house obviously and unfortunately he didn't and he managed to sneak up on her and knock her out by hitting her over the head. She woke up bound and gagged on the kitchen floor and luckily was able to crawl away and crawl towards the window and try to wait for help towards her neighbor who saw her and ended up calling the police. When Bill returned home, he ended up noticing that a few things were missing, including a revolver gun, an antique watch, a video camera, and a radio scanner. In the dining room, the man wrote in crayon on the wall and said, cheaper, but will do, which is literally terrifying. But about four months later, Bill discovered the revolver was left on his porch wrapped in a plastic bag. And over time, the other three objects were quietly replaced, which is literally so terrifying. Like absolutely terrifying. I can't even imagine. So the harasser began to call the whackers super, super often. And he would sometimes threaten them with violence, but other times he would just call and just breathe heavily on the phone, which is so creepy. So obviously the whackers decided to change their phone number several times, but none of it stopped the caller from calling, which is really freaking creepy. Especially without the internet, like I'm surprised that he was able to continuously find the phone number. It's just really weird. At nighttime, they would hear a ton of bangings coming from outside the house, and once they would go and check outside, there was nothing there, and then they couldn't hear it anymore. It was just like super strange things kept happening, and this man was like literally harassing them. So the Wackers then put up a security light, and then later there was a note left on the front porch that said, your lights are a laugh. After that, periodically notes were left on the porch threatening them or just mocking them in general, which is really freaking creepy. No fingerprints were found on the notes as well as it was obvious that the person was writing with their non-dominant hand in order to conceal any handwriting identification that could have happened. On October 27th of 1993, another attack on Dorothy sent her to the hospital with skull laceration. The police searched the neighborhood of course, but they ended up not being able to find anything. So in November of 1993, the Whackers decided to really stake out their house in three groups and they kept in touch with two-way radios the whole time but Bill hid in a trailer in the driveway and her two sons watched from a van across the street and Dorothy and her daughter ended up staying in the house. After about four hours of staking out at around 10.30 p.m., they decided to call off the stakeout. However, right after calling it off, they heard loud noises and they went to the porch and found another note that said, quote, get the message. So clearly this like stalker found some way to watch them without being watched. A lot of people ended up believing that this was a family member, which I find to be an interesting theory, but I don't know if I necessarily believe it. The things that kind of make sense for it to be a family member is the handwriting because to avoid like, like obviously I feel like, like my mom would know my handwriting if she saw it or 
whatever so maybe like this person knows the whackers which is definitely a possibility i would say obviously the stakeout was very suspicious and that's another reason why they thought that it was a possibility that it could have been a family member possibly a family member makes sense as well because of the phone numbers kept changing and they still knew the phone number of course there are other ways around all of those things that could have led it to be an outside person which is kind of what i believe just because it's hard to imagine that like a family member would target like an elderly couple that they are like that they know obviously because they're their family like that just really makes me sad if that were true so i do think it could have been an outsider for sure it is just crazy like that's like so crazy that they were just whoever this was was just harassing this poor elderly couple for no reason the only real evidence that we have of this case is of course the man that came and asked dorothy for uh, to use her phone was described as blonde with blue eyes and they have a police sketch of him and it's obviously believed that the, that's connected to everything else and so obviously dorothy didn't know who this man was so that's why i believe that this man actually was the harasser and i just think it's so crazy and so weird and i just don't understand what the hell is wrong with people that like why would they do that sadly bill passed away in 1999 at the age of 79 and dorothy later passed away in 2010 at the age of 83. this remains completely unsolved and no one has any idea who could have been that was harassing this elderly couple like it's just such a crazy story but i hope that they figure out who did it honestly i feel like it's probably going to be a cold case i feel like it's so many unanswered questions about this case and it's just such a strange situation like at the same time of me feeling like it could be a random person it's kind of like weird to think that it would be because why like there's just so many questions so i would love to hear your guys' opinions and what you think could have happened in the comments below but that is it for today's video if you guys liked it please give it a big thumbs up like i said let me know in the comments below what you guys think about these cases i would love to hear your opinions on them but that is it make sure you follow me on twitter tiktok and instagram because i'm always posting really dope ass shit on there subscribe for new videos every week and i will see you guys later bye